I want to warn you in advance that some of the content in this series may be offensive at times, but that's okay because growth at times requires growth pains. Prolonged immaturity is arguably the most underestimated enemy of God-given destiny. It's time to mature. So get ready for mature audiences only. Good morning, Calvary Church. I, yeah, just stand to your feet for a second and give Jesus the best shout you've given him all week long. Come on. If you're thankful Jesus is in your life, somebody shout amen. If you're thankful Jesus is your life, somebody shout amen. If you're glad he didn't just give you an upgrade, he made you an entirely new creation, somebody shout amen. Now, on your way back to your seat, tell by two or three people saying he made you pretty too. Don't worry. Come on, tell her. Come on. Man, it is good to be in church at Calvary Wallace. No place I'd rather be on Sunday morning. See so many smiling faces. We had a great time at 9 a.m., but I'm glad to see. They always say the, the, the 11 o'clock service is the rowdy bunch, praise God, y'all. Because y'all stayed out late. You got up late. You get... <laughs> You know, I, I don't know what, you don't worry, you were out praising the Lord last night. You know, you got here this morning, you're ready to get your shout on. Man, it's good to see everybody, and I'm excited. Today is special for me because I not only get to preach part eight of our nine-part series for mature audiences only, but I'm joined on platform by my lovely wife. Y'all put your hands together. <laughs> Kayla's joining me today. Might let you sit up here every week. Come on. And, uh, but man, I need this, to keep you, keep you, make sure you behave. All right. Well, that's what I'm we'll going to do. It they didn't work my, for nine. I got my pillows so up work. here so that I can reach the floor and uh, not get a cramp. All right. And well. my foot go to sleep. So. All right. I'm ready. Well, oh, well, you're ready. Well, you'll find out in a minute why she's going to help me because we are in this series for mature audiences only. And just in case you're joining us for the first time, maybe you hadn't been a part of what we've been doing or you're watching online, this is your first week. This is really our discipleship series. This is our chance to look at all the areas of our lives where we can mature and really continue to develop into all that Jesus paid for us to be. As we were born again, new creations, we were babes in Christ. And that means when you're a babe, how many of y'all know you're immature when you're a babe, right? When you're a baby in Christ, you're just, you're immature. There's a lot of things you don't know. Your spirit at that moment, you said yes to Christ. Your spirit is born again and it's as perfect as it ever will be. But you still have immaturities in our soul because we're a new creation. It's just like a baby. You don't expect the baby to operate in maturity and, and, and it's the same way in our faith. We don't expect people to get saved one day and live like a mature believer the next day. That's, that is unrealistic expectation. So we recognize that immaturity is not bad, you know, especially if you're a, a new creation in Christ, as long as you don't stay there. Right. Immaturity is fine for a season. We, we all recognize that, man, you know, there's areas I want to grow in, and that's fine. What I don't want to do is be sitting here 30 years from now in the same place of immaturity in an area of my life and in multiple areas in some cases and not be growing in my walk with Christ. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important for two reasons. One, it's important for you. You need to mature in Christ because if you really are going to experience all the good things that Christ has paid for and made available to you and put on the inside of you through the, by way of the Holy Spirit, then it is absolutely a must that we mature so that we can operate in that level of understanding and take full advantage of everything he gave us. But second, it's not just for you, it's for everybody else. The world needs a mature church. Yes. Boy, I feel like preaching that right there. The, listen, an immature church does the world no good. And we don't need, how many of y'all know babies don't raise babies? Come on, somebody. So we need to be mature in our faith and in these areas of lives, so as others get born again and brought into the kingdom of God, we can help them take that journey of faith as well and continue to grow and as Jesus did in wisdom and in stature and all things pertaining to God. And so that's what we want to do as believers in Christ. So we're new creations, but we got to mature. 
If we gotta mature, we gotta address some things. And so we have, over the last eight weeks, that's what we've been doing. We've addressed how to mature in our message. We've talked about how to mature in our mind, how to mature in our mouths because there's power in what we say. How to mature in our ministry, how we serve others, how we mature in our motives, our heart issues. And in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how to mature in our money because we also recognize how we steward the things God's put in our hands also determine the level of maturity we operate in. Not just in giving, but in management. Not just in sowing and investing, but in making sure that we are being good stewards of everything that God has blessed us with, including our finances. So we've been talking about how to mature in our money. Well, today, I'm excited to share with you. We're going to talk about a topic that will hit everybody. You may not think about it at first, but just stay with me. You may have a tendency to want to tune out today because you're thinking this doesn't apply to me, but let me assure you. By the end of the message, you'll be just like everybody that came up to me after 9 a.m. and say, man, that was right where I am, Pastor. I needed to hear that. Today, we're going to talk about how to mature in our marriage. Ooh, it's going to get tight a little bit and hit. If you're sitting next to your spouse, just hug them for a minute and say, don't worry, this is going to be good. Come on. If you're not sitting next to your spouse or you don't have a spouse, just say, you know what? God's working on me today. Glory to God. And you may be thinking, well, I'm not married. I'm single, never been married, or I'm divorced, or I'm widowed, or whatever you may. So this message isn't for me. No, this, because this message deals with all types of relationships. And you gotta have some kind of relationship. In fact, I've taken a step further. Not only is it in your relationships horizontally, but even in your relationship with God vertically. Because there's some things we gotta recognize that are confined in relationship and connection that God has put in place. And if we don't understand those things, we will abuse them. Let me, let me say this loud and clear. What you don't understand, you have a tendency to abuse. If you don't recognize the, recognize the purpose of a thing, then you'll abuse it. You know what abuse is? Abnormal use. It's whenever I'm trying to make something do something it was not intended to originally do. And so we got to deal with this today when talking about relationships. And I don't care where you're at. Don't, don't think for one minute you need. You may think, well, my marriage is bad. I'm going I'm to sink down on my seat. Or I've been divorced. I'm going to sink down on my seat. Or I've never have never been married. I've had engagements called off. Or, or maybe you're thinking, i got a good marriage. I'm going to sink. No, let me tell you something. No matter where you are at, there is a word in the house for you today. And so I want to deal with this. And we're going to talk about it together and give you some Really, I think probably more than anything, dispel some lies when it comes to relationships and then really talk about how we can heal from hurt that we have either in current relationships or from past relationships so that we can move forward into all the good things God has got for me. Does that sound like a deal to you? Sounds like a deal to me. Stand to your feet, if you would. Let's read together 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Then I want to talk a little bit about marriage and I'm going to have... Kayla just shared because she's got some tremendous insight when it comes to relationships. First Corinthians 13, 11, we're reading it every week. This is what Paul writes. It's on the screen behind me. He says this. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. In other words, Paul says, when I was immature, don't miss this. I spoke in an immature manner. I understood in an immature manner. I thought, my thought process was very immature. However, when I became a man, when I became a woman, when I went from boys to men, come on somebody, <laughs> girls to women. You don't know why I didn't have a girls to women. I love boys to men, they needed girls to women. When I became a mature believer, watch this, I put away childish Things. Do me a favor before you find your seat. Tell two or three people just say, this is going to make us better today. Come on, tell them that. Come on. Well, this topic is relevant to every single one of us. Maturing in our marriage and our relationships. It is critical that we align our views with God's views. In every single aspect of our life, including our relationships. You need to know the purpose of relationships. You need to be able to assess the relationships you have in your life. Not just to determine whether they're beneficial or toxic, but also to determine what that relationship is designed to do in your life. Let me make myself plain. There's some people that God's brought to you in your life that you're supposed to have friendship with. How many of y'all know that? Yeah. 
you have friends, right? I don't mean Facebook friends. I'm talking about actual friends. We've almost redefined friends. No, I'm talking about people you can have conversation with. How you doing? Doing good, blessed, and highly flavored. Glory to God. But there's other people that God's put in your life that you have partnership with, that you are called to build something with. In other words, those people that God's put in your life because they have something you need and you have something they need. And we got to make sure, you, just mixing up those two things can really cause you a lot of heartache. Have you ever tried to do business with a friend and it not work out well? And you end up nearby ruining the friendship. Why? Because you were trying to have partnership. You were trying to do, go in business together. You, try, you tried to bring them into your world and y'all had this great idea. And man, you know, sometimes it works out. But sometimes you need to realize God put that person in your life not so you can build or create anything. They put them in your life just to be a blessing to you. So be an encouragement for you to actually hang out with and unwind because you can be yourself. And sometimes you can't be yourself around somebody you're in business with because that'll make them squirrely. Y'all know what I'm saying, right? Or have, let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to be friends with somebody you feel like God just put in your life just for business purpose? Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's uh, 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 you know, somebody like a, that you started a business with and you were like, well, I don't understand. You know, we're business partners. But my God, I, I always you know, want to go to lunch, want to go to dinner. They really don't want to ever hang out or anything. And all they, were, all they care about is the bottom line. Well, you need to understand, God did not put them in your life so you could have somebody to eat dinner with. God brought them into your life because they have a skill that complements your skills and together you can do something significant and build something of value. But if you don't understand and discern the purpose that are in your life, then you will abuse the relationship. And it'll cause you to be frustrated. It'll cause them to run for the hills and make you feel like, man, this, just, this thing ain't working out. Now, some people, you can do both. It's fine. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you need to recognize there's some relationships God's put in life for a specific purpose, and you've got to be able to discern what that purpose is. Are y'all getting this? I can't tell you how many times I've messed things up because God wanted me to be somebody's pastor, not their friend. Now, now watch this. I don't mean I'm not friendly. I, I'm friendly to everybody. But, but I recognize that because of the place of immaturity we, either I or the other person was is that the moment we begin to be friends, I can no longer speak into their life as a pastor. Yeah. And you know what it did? It messed up the relationship. Wow. It messed up both ways. And then I was frustrated. They were mad. And we ended up not even being anything. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't understand the purpose of the relationship. And there's some people that are absolutely, there's a lot of, most people, in fact, I can be friends with and be their pastor. You just got to know that when I'm putting my pastor hat on, I'm speak to you because some people can't handle it. Friends don't want to be talked to by their pastor. We can be riding down the road and I can say something to Tyler and you know, Tyler and say, is this coming from Pastor Brad or just Brad? Or I say, don't oh, yeah. preach at me, Brad Carter. That's right. That's what I say. When I go home and I, I walk in the house, I can't run the house like I run church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Why? Because I'll be running out of the house. Glory to God. <laughs> I'm not the CEO of the house. I, you know, I'm just glad to have a place to lay my head and like Jesus. But anyway, so, so, so it's important to be able to discern relationships. And all of us have relationships. I don't care how much of a loner you are. You got a relationship because if you weren't, you wouldn't be saved. You got a relationship with God. And even understanding that relationship and how it functions is key to us prospering when it comes to our connections. So today I want to talk about it. Again, I'm honored to have my wife you know, join me up on platform. You're going to hear from her a lot because I want her to share some insights God's given her, especially pertaining marriage. Now, again, no matter where you're at on the scale, hear me out. There's going to be a word for you in this. So just stay with me. There'll be some things you think, well, nope, that, that doesn't pertain to me. But let me just go ahead and warn you. Be careful about vows you make before the Lord. Let me say it like this. Be careful what you say you won't never do. I had people come up to me at the first service and said, Pastor, I've sworn I'd never get married again until that last, I ain't never going to say that again because you scared me at, at 9 a.m. <laughs> I, started, I started thinking it might happen again after you got through talking. So, so, so just stay with me. We're going to walk through this thing together. But I want to do it in this manner. I want to address five what I believe are lies concerning. Again, we'll take primarily the stance of marriage, but it does apply to many, if not most, relationships. Number one is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Marriage is not, everybody say not, not, is not a cure for your problems. Right. Yeah. Come on. Woo. Well, it's going to get hot and heavy. 
Marriage is not a cure for your problems. If you think that God designed marriage to be your fix-all, how many of y'all know? I say it like this. You know, you know what? Y'all know what Puffy and Biggie said, right? More money, more problems. More marriage, more problems too. If you think marriage is going to eliminate your problems, here's what I've come to figure out. When you try to think marriage is what fixes all your problems, you'll actually end up with more problems. That's right. It does. It illuminates your, your issues often. A great example for this would be, I can remember, you know, Pastor Kelly and I have been married now for 20 years. So we know everything there is about marriage. <laughs> We realized the last two weeks we don't know nothing. Hallelujah. <laughs> we, almost, we almost canceled today's service because we figured we, after two weeks, last two weeks, we ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> been a challenge with my health stuff. So, so, so here's, let me give you an example. We've been married 20 years, but we dated for 10. We started dating when we were teenagers. So we dated for 10 years. Yes, I was slow, ladies. I'm sorry. I'm, everybody kept saying, y'all ever going to get married? And finally she said, after 10 years, she said, No. And so she broke up with me and then I had to get married to her a year later. Glory to God. But this, here's a lie that I believed. I really thought, I said, you know, when, when, you were, when I was in my, my teenage years and we were dating, my young 20 years, you know as well as I do, there's a lot of young men that, that wrestle, of course, with lust in, the, in those years. And I remember thinking, man, I cannot wait to get married. Because if, if I just get married, I won't have to worry about that temptation anymore. Boy, if, you, if that wasn't a lie, glory to God, right? How many of y'all know there's plenty of married men by the zillions that struggle, and I'm using lust in this example, with lust. Getting married doesn't eliminate that problem. In fact, they can actually you know, magnify that problem if you hadn't had the problem dealt with. But in my mind, I was thinking, well, if I just get married, then I'll have a wife. Then we have covenant relationship where that sex falls underneath that umbrella that God created. Then all my, all my temptations, any other desires, any of that stuff would go away. And how many of y'all know that's not the case? Why? Because marriage is not the cure. It's not. Marriage is not the cure for your financial problems. Right. I don't care what that reality TV show says. Marrying that millionaire ain't going to fix all your problems. I don't care how many roses they give you. There's still going to be a prenup. Right? And what we think, oh, if I can just get married, if I can just get married, if I can just get married, married, then it's going to cure my problems. And let me just say this. Guys, it ain't just us that struggles with that. Hello, what's an example for ladies? So, yeah. So I, I remember um, you were talking about unrealistic expectations earlier. And um, I don't know exactly what I was entering into marriage thinking, but um, I exceeded in- all expectations. <laughs> you are so funny. Um, <laughs> I, re- I remember before we got married, I remember us being in a very stress, stressful, we were just in a very stressful time. He was coaching ball. Um, we were both very involved in our community and very involved in everything and just everything. And, um, and I was working out of town and all the time and, you know, and so our life was just a little stressed plus planning a wedding and all that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, not having a lot of money (laughs) and, uh, you know, and so that there was a lot of stress factors added, but my mindset was when we get married, Brad's just going to fix everything. Everything is going to be fixed. <laughs> I remember I was us, close. I broke everything. So well, I was close. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say this. You know, we, we fought all the time. I remember us fighting just constantly, constantly. And again, going into marriage, I'm thinking, well, when we get married, we're not going to fight like this anymore. <laughs> and I think our our first little neighborhood that we lived in, God bless them, whoever they are. But I think that they can attest that that did not fix our problems when we got married. Marriage did not do that. Marriage in and of itself did not fix our problems. And I think that, um, you know, you know, I, I think that we go in t- with these unrealistic expectations into marriage and we have these fantasies in our mind of what it's supposed to look like, what it's going to look like. And, you know, that's society and just what we see modeled before us. And so we go into it with this mindset of thinking, oh, we're just going to cut the TV off at night and just hold hands and go to bed together and just going to be so sweet. 
Just so sweet. And then your reality does not. That really doesn't even sound good to any of the guys. Really. I know it doesn't to the guys, but it would like, be so good. I don't so remember good. having that dream. <laughs> I was watching football. You were asleep. That's exactly. It would be so good to go to sleep to total silence and not the sound of and all that kind of stuff going on in a football game. But what I'm saying is like, you know, just these fan, these things, you're just leading yourself up to this disappointment. And even the pressure that I had put on you in and of itself of to fulfill these, these, these needs and these fantasies and things that I've come up with. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's my, our perspective, you know, or my perspective and, and women in general, you know, we, you know, men, they, um, won't respect women. We want to be taken care of and loved. I mean, that's generally what we feel. Um, I mean, you know, that looks totally different to everybody individually, but in and of itself overall, that's what we desire. So. Yeah, and I think, too, I think that we, we get this idea, you know, here, here's what I need you, everybody to understand is what God wants is to bring you to a place where you can trust him for whatever your need is, right. whatever your problem is, whatever your challenge is, whatever your, your issue is. And, and that doesn't matter if you're married or if you're single. It doesn't matter if you're engaged or you're divorced. God wants to show that I'm giving you marriage just a gift. And marriage does help. I mean, I think Paul even says it. He says, listen, listen, if you're, if you're, if you're wrestling in lust, it's better, better to get married and burn. I mean, you know, go ahead and, 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 and take the leap. But marriage is not the answer. It's not the prescription to fix your, your issue. Jesus is, has been, is, and always will be. And it doesn't matter if you're single, married, or other. At the end of the day, you've got to come to the place where you recognize that that's Jesus' job, not the job of the institution of my marriage. Because if I start to think, if I'm misappropriating that that is the source of any of my meeting my needs, then the moment that's not there, my needs aren't being met. Because let me tell you something. Everything else in your life can leave you, but Jesus never will. Everything. Your marriage may not end in divorce. It may end in death. But listen, I, I mean, I've watched grandparents sit around and, you know, and when they, their, their spouse of 50 years, you know, has, has, you know, transitions to be with the Lord. It's like, man, I can't imagine that emptiness. Well, can you imagine how empty that is if you put that marriage or that spouse in the seat where the God's supposed to sit? And so we got to be real careful. We don't think marriage is our cure, no matter what the outcome is. Second thing is this. This is a big one right here. You need to get this. Marriage, this is going to come as a shock to some. I love, I love having, I love that we got Pastor Jamel and Bree on the front row because they're, they're two weeks away from getting married. I mean, right? And it's two weeks? Two weeks away from getting married. Come on, put your hands together for that. We're going well, this to this, charge you as a session for premarital counseling right here. Wish I'd have had this right here. N- n- number two is this, don't miss this. Marriage is not primarily about you. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, this is going to be, this, this, I would love to hear the, the lunch table discussions on this point right here. How many times have we sat across from people and heard this, Kayla? <sighs> he just doesn't do it for me anymore. She no longer makes me happy. You know, not, and, and you know what I really want to say, and no kind of, and maybe you're sitting there thinking, I think I told you that, Pastor. You know, don't worry. You are not by yourself, all right? We've all thought that. Every one of us have thought that. But my first thought when I hear that is, who, sweetie, who told you it was his job to make you happy? Like, where did you read in your Bible that it was her role, her duty to make you fulfilled? Like, what, what, see, culture can I just be honest with you? We got way too much of our marriage theology from Nicholas Sparks and not enough from the Word. This, we have turned Jerry Maguire's You Complete Me into a doctrine. I don't even like that movie. But, like, it, is, it is insane how we have developed this idea that it's, you know, it's about me. And you can always tell, it's interesting because in counsel you can always tell when the spiral, the downward spiral starts because the language changes. Yeah. Because it starts to sound like, well, I don't get what I want anymore. Or it, it's not doing it. It's not doing anything for me anymore. Or, I, or I'm never this or I'm never that. And it's like, and that, that is not just in marriage. That's in any relationship. You've got friendships that have gone sour because you started thinking, well, 
I mean, I, you know, they're not, I do more for them than they do for me. You know what that is? That is the sound, that is the language right there of deteriorating relationship. Yeah. And it's, it's not confined to marriage, but it absolutely happens. And we see it all the time. Talk about how marriage is not primarily about us or making us happy. Well, I, that's exactly how I went into marriage. I don't know where I got that from or what, you know, we've talked about that. But literally, it was your job to make me happy. And then, if you made me... When I was in the unemployment line about twice a day. (laughs) And if you made me happy, and you did these things on my list, then I would show you affection and be kind to you. And, 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 you know, but you had to do that checklist. Did that happen a lot? No. Yes. Oh, no. No, <laughs> no because everything. Speaking about faith, I've rewritten my past okay. at the cross. Hallelujah. And the Lord does not attach it to you anymore, but I'm going there today. And, um, and what I have to say is, you know, it, you know, the thing, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, why did, why? Why is that? I mean, why, why did we pick that up as a society as the lady that we have to be happy that he has to make me happy and I, and and i don't i don't know when i woke up to this but i said well why can't he be happy too and why can't listen to patrick That's what i like feedback well, <laughs> it's a participation message but you, <laughs> yeah, but he didn't wait for that minute he, he did yeah there's something on the inside rose up he did. I mean, and, and you know, and so I'm just thinking to myself, why is this so one-sided? And why did, did I mean, and this is my perspective, and this is the things that I did. Because, you know, no matter what I do in life, I can't change you. And I can't do anything about what you're doing. So you were doing your thing. You were just everywhere. You were somewhere else. You were not home. I know that. I got a cat to prove it because I really wanted to. I was just lonely. He was just coaching ball, doing all these things. And. You know, so I got a cat just to keep me lonely. And now I keep me uh, comforts because I was lonely. And so, um. The cat hid under the bed all the time. Yeah, that didn't work. She made the cat miserable. <laughs> I did. I made the cat miserable. I put expectations. You want to get a job? She's yelling at the cat. I made, I gave the cat too many expectations. And so he couldn't live up to my standards. And so anyway, so I just, you know, I, as long as you did these things, then you got love and affection and um probably um one of the things that i i love this line and let me look let me see what it says okay in this line i i was reading this it says um i think it's so important that marriage is a training ground for what learning to forgive and love unconditionally truly looks like i mean think about it you're in marriage it's you're in and you, it is like literally a training ground for you to show the love of Christ unconditionally with no strings attached, with nothing in return, loving without a because. And I think that the biggest lesson that, that, that I learned that when my mindset started changing and flipping in that way was when I was a mother for the first time. So I got this baby, this newborn baby, and he is so precious and I love him so much and I would do anything on this earth for this baby. And I and and he is wearing me down, y'all. I mean, I got throw up all over my shirt. I mean, I got bags under my eyes where I hadn't slept and I'm tired and I'm ill and I just look like a sight and I, I kind of look a little bit homely and it's just real bad and, and he comes home. I know you're scared of me for a little while and um, whenever I was a new mom, but I mean, I you know, I'm just in this and, I, and he is pulling all this from me and, you know, and all this life from me. I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. And yet I would go and give my life no doubt, no thought into it whatsoever for that baby. I would give, I would give any, I love this baby. And I will never forget the Holy Spirit. I'm holding this baby and I'm so tired and I'm falling asleep rocking him. And he wasn't sleeping, but I wanted to. And, I, and I'm rocking this baby and I'm sitting there looking and the Holy Spirit said, this baby takes a lot from you, doesn't he? And I'm like, oh yeah, he does. But now I love him. I love my, my baby Brevin. And the Holy Spirit said, why can't you love Brad like you love Brevin? 
with no strings attached, no things, no conditions, nothing that he's, because this baby's taken everything. Brevin did not sit up in that moment and say, Mama, you are so on this today. You're rocking it. You are killing the game. You Thank you so much for changing my diaper the way you did. Thank you for feeding me. Brevin did not do that, not one time. And, you know, and, and, and now, because, you know, of, of his maturity, now he does thank me for things. Now, I don't change his diaper, but I give him food and things like that. And so it's, so it's really, that was, that was the beginning, I think, of the mindset change for me as to what unconditional, the training ground for unconditional love and how to walk that out daily and how, and I'm, and just being kind, it started with just being kind. Well, and, and I think that is the, that's the key. You talked about the training ground. You know, marriage really is the place where God allows us to live out grace. Yeah. To, to show grace, yeah. To fail to and blow still it, lo- love. To mess it up yeah. constantly, but yeah. to extend mercy yeah. and grace, you know. And I think, the, I think the issue is, is we think marriage is primarily about happiness. Right. But in God's eyes, marriage is primarily about holiness. More about holiness than happiness. It's more about bringing things together right. and, 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 and creating that atmosphere, that environment to be able to live this thing out. Right. And, and really to express the goodness of God in relationship um, that, that becomes an extension of our relationship with him. And so, right. so I, do, I, I love that. But, but it, again, it's not, about, it's not about you. It's not about getting. And, and listen, here, here's how, yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't have happiness in your marriage. Right. I'm not saying start treating your marriage like a nine to five as a job and you shouldn't have any joy in it. No, it's the opposite. But the purpose of marriage is not to make you happy. Right. It's not. That Jesus is all you need to be. So watch this. Here's the good news about that. Here's the good news. One, if you're married and, and, you're, and you're, you know, you're struggling with happiness, you're looking in the wrong place, just turn to Jesus. That's good news for you because Jesus will be there and he'll make you happy. Watch this. Here's the other good news. If you're single and you're not married, good news. You don't have to get married to get happy. Right. Can the single people at least wave at me and say, good word, Pastor. Like that's not, like you don't have to, so, so why? Because my happiness is not, the right. source of my happiness is not my marriage. Now, my marriage makes me happy. It does. There's good things. I, obviously, I enjoy being married. But my source has always got to be Jesus. Right. Every single time. Because if not, it ain't, it ain't, it's, it's, it's going to be misappropriated. We got to move on. Number three is yeah. this. This is a big one right here. Okay. You don't find a soulmate. You become one. We place so much. Now, I'm not saying you should not have discernment and prayer and Holy Ghost when you're finding your spouse. Yeah. Somebody said, do I need the Holy Ghost to, to go into marriage? I said, you need the Holy Ghost to go into the convenience store. Glory to God. <laughs> but yes, you need, you, know, you, need to, you need to pray about it and everything. But watch this. We place so much emphasis on making the right choice yeah. that we think if I just find the right one, that everything else is going to fall in place. So we're in search all the time for the right one. That's right. And, and let me just say this. The greatest choice you make is not the spouse you choose to be with. It's the spouse you choose to become. That's so good. I'm convinced of this. I'm, there is not a, I am so happily married, as happily married as I've ever been. I told her, yeah, I sent her a text last night and said I don't know. I've never loved you more than I love you right now. That's the truth. Now, we have had, for some of y'all going, y'all about to make me sick. You don't, if you went through all we went through, you'd understand why I say that. But let me just say, let me say, there's, there, there's I, I know this to be a truth. If I would have not married, married Kayla, if she would have decided, nope, we're not getting married, and I would have married somebody else. If I would become the husband God has designed me to be, my marriage would still be successful. It would have been. Why? Because it's not predicated on me just finding the right person. It's predicated on me being the right person. And you can find the right person and not be the right person and still have a jacked up marriage. When we got married, she, I believe she was the right one. And it turned out I was right. But for the first three years, because of the way I lived my life, our marriage was hell, even though I chose the right one. Why? Because I, I wasn't becoming the right one. And it is important to understand. Now, let me, let me alleviate some pressure right here, okay, quickly. 
Because I don't know how you thought about this thing, but this is how I thought about it. How many of y'all believe that there's just that there's somebody out there God designed specifically for you? That's just one and one only. Anybody else believe that? I'm the only one. Raise your hand if you like thought to yourself, like God's got a soulmate out there for you. Okay, I'm okay, just make sure. So I remember thinking, this is a true story. I can remember one day thinking, all right, Kayla, I believe Kayla is the one God created for me. The one, the numero uno, only one. But what if she's not? If she's not, what if, if God created somebody else for me that I, I don't even know maybe exists and I marry her, I married the wrong one. I'm outside of God's will. I didn't do, I didn't marry the person God wanted me to. Oh, no, watch this. And then my mind started to run. Now listen to this. So I said, if I married the wrong one, if she's not the right one and I married her, then she's married the wrong one. So we both messed up. But not only are we messed up, the person I was supposed to marry is going to end up marrying the wrong one because I'm married to her. And the person she was going to marry is going to marry somebody else and they're wrong. And before you knew it, I had unraveled the entire universe. The whole world is in our hands. <laughs> because, I had, because I had made a bad, because I messed up. I picked A, door number A instead of door number B. And door B. I mean, it's nuts. I remember thinking, my God, do you know how much pressure put on? So then I'm like, I don't know if that. Maybe that's why it took me 10 years to ask her to marry me. Because all the civilization was hinging on me making the right decision. Do you see how when you put that in proper perspective, how ridiculous that is? I'm not saying, listen, some of y'all are saying, you're ruining our Valentine's month. No, let me tell you, I'm not saying they're not the one for you. I'm just saying, get out of your mind that making that one right choice makes everything right. Because let me tell you what marriage is. Marriage is not about just making one right choice. It's about making a consistent trail of the right choices day in and day out, solid decisions that are beneficial to the relationship. That's the, the, you know what decisions matter? When I decide to wake up in the morning and love my wife like Christ loved the church. That's the decision I got to make. You know what matters? When I decide I, I, that I've got to continue to grow and to mature and to be the husband God created me to be. Because that's what's going to bless our marriage. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, um, I think that... And I the, do think you're the right one, by the way. I didn't want to... Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so we didn't mess up all the civilization. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. You see, you, you see how we think that world revolves around us, though? Yeah. Like that is a, and, and we don't mean to be narcissistic, but we really are. Yeah, right. yes. And the only world that revolves around you is your world. Yeah. And that's a pretty small world. Right. Yeah. Okay. Shh. Um... <laughs> So on becoming a soulmate, I think, I, I think that one of the biggest things for me um, is learning to, another thing, I learned a lot, um, but learning to become a contributor in my marriage instead of a consumer. So I go into marriage thinking, That's every relationship what can too. I take, every relationship, what can I take from this relationship? This relationship's about me. It's about me, 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 me. And, what can, and it was all about taking. And when I had to flip that switch in my mind of what can I put into this relationship, it changed everything. Because I started looking at you so differently. I remember I was like, God, okay, we're, we're married, we're one. What can I do like, what can I do right now to make you the best man that you can possibly be? I want you, I want you to become the best Brad Carter that you can possibly be. I want you to reach your potential. I want, because when you reach your potential, then that flows into every part of our home. That flows to me. That flows to our kids and their identity and our identity and, and, and just truly becoming like, I mean, if I can contribute to that and I can tr pull the treasure out of you because you because you have and I remember you know just being a distraction I really remember being a distraction because you were doing a lot of stuff you were in seminary you were preaching you were working a full-time job and you know and I remember being needy 
and just being like, you know, because I look to you to, 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 to fill my needs at that time. And, and so I'm always constantly needing. And that was a distraction. And the Holy Spirit really had to get on me and say, look, this is not about you. It's not about this. You've got to help him become the best him that he can be. And in turn, because of that happening, because of that switch, you became, started pulling the treasure out of me and trusting me. To, to make decisions in the church, making decisions over our home, making decisions, important stuff. And you started actually letting me be your partner in life instead of, I'm going to go do this thing. You stay at home with the kids, you know, because that's how I, how I felt for so many years. And then you really started pulling me along and saying, okay, come on and take my place as Pastor Kayla. That's who you are. And so it started affirming me. And so it's just so important to pull, to be a contributor in your marriage, become a soulmate, become a person that your, your spouse can trust. And then and pull in the treasure and, and dip, you know, what can I give? What can I give? And, um, and it's so I, I, I remember that. I just remember you, the, the credit, all that you, you started replacing criticism with encouragement. And that one thing is like, instead of complaining about what you weren't getting, you're encouraging what yeah. you can do for me. And I remember, I'll never forget this, and I, I think I said this at 9 a.m., but, but if all you ever hear, let, ladies, let me just help you out. If all he ever hears every time he walks in the door is criticism, he he'll walk in the door less and less. He will that, find places to be. He, he will, the, the, more, the more she would gripe and complain about it, the less I wanted to be there, so the more I was doing outside. Now, that wasn't right. That, that was my coping mechanism because yeah. I didn't want to hear it. Even yeah, though, I was stuck with was the true. kids. I couldn't go nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to, though. <laughs> so, but, so I'm just going to go out and save the world for Jesus. And, yeah. and that way I ain't got to deal with it at home. Yeah. I'm going to go out and pour myself into coaching ball. And I'm going to pour myself into doing things that were good things. Because he was a hero outside of the home. Yeah. I, I, that's why I, I was respected. getting praise. He, you were getting respect. You were getting praise. You were getting the things. You were getting your needs met outside. And, you know, because you were the hero. You were a great guy. Great pastor, great Boy, preacher, every great time she heard that, she'd get so mad. <laughs> I did. Somebody come up to me in the food line and start talk, talk, talking I, about I how really wonderful like my husband is. She'd go, like, Ugh, yeah. you don't know him. Yeah. But no, <laughs> but really, I mean, I had to come to that realization. And, and I call them mirror moments. And literally, the Holy Spirit, I would be griping and complaining and hanging up his clothes and putting, pushing them in the drawer and murmuring and complaining. And the Holy Spirit would always just stop me. And I would have these mirror moments where I literally looked in the mirror and he was like, would you want to be home with you right now? And I was like, oh gosh, no, I really wouldn't want to be me home and y'all need to go me. buy your wife one of them mirrors when you get out of here. It's not a magic mirror. It's okay. <laughs> But, but what I'm saying is, it's just, I can't be responsible for him, but I can be responsible for myself and my decisions and my looking, being totally just vulnerable in a mirror and looking at myself and the things that I can contribute and the things that I can do to better my marriage. What if, what if you, what if, okay, step outside of marriage for a moment. What if in every one of your friendships, your goal and aspiration became, how can I add value to that person's life? Not what can I get out of it? Not what can they do for me? What if you just flip the script? What if at work, your, your work relationships, you stop saying how I can use that person to, to help me and started saying, how can, I, how can I do everything in my power to make that person's life better? What if we changed the narrative on that? Do you know what that would do to relationships? Yeah. That would, it changes the game. Not just in marriage, in any single relationship you got what if instead of you trying to encourage your kids so they can make you feel proud you encourage your kids so that they can be the best version of them God's created them to be ain't got nothing to do with what it does for you like you that just changes everything we got to move on listen number four this will be a quick one because I'm not I don't have time to break this down but here it is marriage is a covenant relationship now we live in a world full of contracts contractual agreements and that's what really the world has defined marriage as. You go to the magistrate's office, you get an, a, a contract, you get signed, you get witnesses, you get a, a notary, and, and, and boom, it's, it's, it's a contract. In the eyes of God, it's covenant. And stay with me, don't you leave. Stay, I'm, I'm about done, but I'll, you gotta hear this. Here's the difference. Contracts are written and designed around mistrust. 
The purpose of a contract is to protect you from the other person not doing what they're supposed to do. It protects your cell phone company in the event you stop paying the bill and honoring your part of the deal. Why? Because everything is built into it. All the clauses, everything, all the parameters are set. Why? Because you're going into it saying, I don't trust you enough to do the right thing, so I got to put in writing all this stuff to make sure it's going to hold your feet to the fire. It's like a prenup. Covenant, don't miss this, is built around trust. It's built around the promise of I'm never going, in, my power, in all my power, I'm never going to abuse you or do any, try to take advantage of you. And that's what marriage is built upon. Marriage is built, it's a covenant relationship, so it's built on trust, whereas contractual agreements are built on mistrust. So why is that important? Well, because we need to understand God's purpose of marriage. God's purpose of marriage, and, and don't get mad at me, stay with me to the end. God's purpose of marriage is, it is a permanent covenant. That's what God designed it to be. Now, there are stipulations in your Bible that talk about what those, the, the deal breakers are. You know, it talks about adultery, you know, infidelity. It talks about abuse. So, so understand, there are, those are not escape clauses, but those are parameters that are set in place. And let me just say this, and I, and I, I mean this with all sincerity. I have sat, had sat in front of too many people who have remained in abusive relationships because somebody from the clergy has convinced them that, that God would rather have them have the hell beat out of them day in and day out than to get out of the relationship and end the covenant marriage. And I do not believe that. God did not design you for that. God, he did not create you for that. But I do understand God's purpose behind marriage. Now, here's what we got to also understand. Let's leave this to our last point is this. When it comes to divorce, when it comes to separation, when it comes to all those things, grace abounds, it's the last point, for those who fail in marriage. Now, don't, don't take that word fail and go, oh, that feels so bad. No, no let me tell you. We all fail in everything. I failed in marriage. I didn't end to, maybe it didn't end with the same result others have, but there are plenty of days when I failed in marriage. But grace abounds where there has been failure in marriage. Let me tell you why that's important. I am not saying we should water down the high premium God places on marriage. But what I am saying is we need to also honor the high prestige God places on grace as much as we do on the institution of the covenant of marriage. Because what we've done is we've made, we've made, we said, okay, well, oh, you know what? This is what God says. God's serious about marriage. So what we've done in, in a lot of church cultures, we've created a culture full of condemnation for people who have had failed marriages. And then they feel like they're disqualified from what God wants to do in their life or from them ever obtaining happiness through relationship. And so what we've done is we have created a culture of condemnation that has not made those people feel like they're welcome and accepted by God. And, and so watch this. We have, we have basically said this. We are serious about protecting marriage, but we're not serious about protecting grace. We, we, we're going to make sure that we stand our ground when it comes to, you know, telling people where they stand. If, you're, if you've been divorced, then my goodness, then there are certain things you cannot do. Well, let me tell you something. If, if that's the case, then you don't believe in the redemptive power of God. If you think for one minute that a mistake by a human can override the forgiveness of God, the supreme being, then let me tell you right now, you do not understand the gospel. You don't. You miss it. And that is not some, oh, well, we really know this is, it's just, you're just making it easy for people to make. No, I'm not making anything easy. Divorce ain't never easy. It ain't, ne- people always get hurt. I'm not watering anything down, but what I'm telling you is, is that not for one moment can you live, the moment you receive the life of Christ, and you need to understand this, and when you begin to allow the grace of God to bathe over you, here's what you gotta recognize. You lose the permission to disqualify yourself from anything God has for you. You lose it. You don't, you don't get to determine that anymore. So don't give me this mess. Well, I know, but yeah, but what about this? What about this? What about this? Don't be pulling mess out of context and talking to me about what people can or can't do based on the way you interpret scripture completely taken out of the context of the culture in which it was written in. I ain't got time for that. But it's important for us to recognize 
that there's grace no matter where we're at. Watch this. There are people right now, maybe in this room or watching online, and your marriage is a mess. I mean, it is a mess. Guess what? There's grace for that. Right. Well, I, well, I, Pastor, you don't understand how bad it is. I'll never, you'll never be able to convince me. My, my marriage is done. We're at the end of our rope. Yeah, I understand. I, yeah, I get it. I get it. I don't, maybe I don't know your exact situation, but I can tell you right now. I, we've sat in rooms with couples. And had a man sit across. I'll never forget this. This is one of the most eye-opening moments of my life. The first time we were ever doing marriage counseling. Because most times it's people come to you. Oh, we're having problems in our marriage. Like, okay, what is it? Well, not enough, not enough you know, dinner cooked. Not enough attention. Not enough sex. Not enough money. Something like that. And you, and you talk through it. And, they all, and everybody's like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, we're going to work on this. And it's all good. I remember sitting in my office for the first time. And I had a guy look at me. And he said, Pastor, with all due respect to you and God, there ain't nothing you're ever going to say or do to make me love that woman. And I went. I swallowed hard and said, this is real. He said, oh, yeah, ain't nothing you can ever do. I don't love her anymore. I want to be with her. Ain't nothing you can say that's going to change it. And today that couple's married and happily married yeah. with kids thriving in their marriage. So don't tell me what God can't do. And all I'm asking you is this, to be available. To be available. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, well, our marriage, our marriage is all right. I mean, it could, it could be better. It could be, okay, if it can be better, it will be. You just got to trust God in it. Right. You got to trust God. What does that look like? I'm going to trust God in it. I'm literally going to say, okay, I'm going to put into practice some of these things. I'm going to stop looking at what I can get out of it. Right. And start saying, what can I invest in it? I'm going to stop making it. Here's the thing. You can make marriage an idol in your life. You can you make marriage your God. Now, I'll be honest with you. In our culture, we've made, we've, we've made yeah. wedding our God more than marriage our God. Oh, yeah. And we got people who, who spend months planning for an event. And let me tell you something. That night, when it's all said and done and the last song's played and the DJ's packing up <laughs> and they're cleaning up all the silverware off the tables, ain't nothing left to do but pay the bill. The event's over and most people, they invest more in the wedding than they do the, the marriage. Right. And then you do like I did, and you wake up the next morning in the Waltersboro, South Carolina Holiday Inn looking in a mirror going, I'm married. Yeah. Mine was six do. months later, and I was like, oh, God. Mine was, mine was the first night, the, the first morning of the honeymoon, the day after we got married, I looked in the mirror. I'll never forget, I stared in the mirror and thought to myself, I am married, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> And we had dated 10 years. So, so, so I, don't, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you are sitting here this morning. And I'm going to ask Pastor Kelly to pray us out. And just pray over But maybe you're sitting here this morning. And you're like, man, I have failed. I failed in marriage. I'm sitting here divorced. And, and maybe it's because of one of those things in the Bible. Maybe it was because you, you had to get out of an abusive relationship. Or maybe there was infidelity. Or maybe you're sitting there going, you know what? Pastor, I gotta be honest. I, I, I didn't even have those terms, but my marriage is over. And in some cases, maybe it wasn't even you making the decision. It was the other person. There's grace for you. In fact, if that's you, this is what I'll tell you. Had somebody asked me, said, said, Pastor, I blew it. You know, I, 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 I shouldn't have, I shouldn't, I didn't have terms to get a divorce. And I was like, listen, don't, we're not trying to go back and make things right. Let's make it right today. I don't want to beat you up over what you did. Let's correct the pattern. They said, can we do that? I said, yeah, and this is how. You ready? Watch this. If that's you, here's what you need to do. If you're wrestling with condemnation because of a failed marriage, failed relationship, then I want you to hear me out. Number one, rest. Rest in the fact that you are not in condemnation. That it... For those who are in Christ, there is therefore no condemnation. Not for those who didn't have failed marriage or not for those who didn't blow it or not for those who didn't follow the guideline. For, for those who are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation rest in that. Second thing I want you to do is watch this. Confess. Just go to God. Just in your time with God. You don't have to. Listen, you are not Catholic. You ain't getting behind a curtain. It ain't, you ain't got to say it in King James language. But, but sometime today, just go, God, I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I blew it. I blew it. I sinned. I, I, I shouldn't have done this. I, 
maybe I ended it prematurely or maybe I did some things I shouldn't have done or maybe I caused the other person to or whatever. But God, I just want to confess. I just want to get it out. Not so he'll forgive you. He's already forgiven you at the cross. But so you can get it out of your system. Confess. Just get it out. You, ain't just, you and God just confess it. And after you confess it, you got to start trusting God. That's when, you know what you got to do here? Watch this. Be available for what he says is next. Just say, stop saying what won't happen. And I get it. Some of y'all are like, hey, Pastor, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm divorced and I've never been happier in my life and I'm not planning on getting married. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. But don't tell God what you are going to do. Just say, hey, God, I just want you to know, like, whatever you got planned for me, I'm good with because I trust you. If you're not willing to do that, you're still sitting in God's seat. And at some point, you got to say, and it, maybe it's not marriage. I'm talking about what if it's friendships? There's friendships that have been ruined. You know what you got to say? You got to make it, well, I'm, I, you know what? I'm tired of people hurting me. I'm just cutting people off. You cannot live like that. That's not how God designed you. He designed you for community. I don't care how introverted you think you are. God created you for relationship. Because here's what happens. You start by turning away others. And you end up trying to turn away him. When you allow your heart to be poisoned with mistrust, it pours over into your relationship with God. It does. It spills over. And you'll go from saying, oh, all, all I need, like grandma, just me, all I need is Jesus, baby. Nope, grandma, that's not how he set it up. I'm sorry. But there are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God or tantos. He's created you for a relationship. So if that's you, I just want you to think about it. Just like, God, I am, I'm qualified. I'm loved. I'm accepted. Yes, I blew it, but you know what? Everybody you've ever made eye contact, eye contact with has blown it. Maybe they didn't blow it like you blew it. Maybe they, didn't, maybe, there's, they, maybe they didn't blow it in a failed marriage, but they had a failed business. There's been times everybody in this room has blown it when it comes to trusting God. So you know what? You're not by yourself, but you got to get over it. And the only way to get over it is by letting God do what only God can do. You are not disqualified okay let me ask you to pray over over everybody and, and, and as we do I want to just be mindful of this I know it's 1245 but I want to do this in a manner that, that allows space for healing so I'm going to ask you when she begins to pray I want you to just if you would literally you bow your head and close your eyes as she is ministering and speaking and you're receiving it if it's speaking to you where you're at and you're needing God to get involved maybe it's in your messy marriage or maybe it's in the pain from your divorce or maybe you've been widowed maybe maybe your, your marriage ended in death and now you're like I don't know how to get back up and, and even think about doing this again I can't even well there's grace for that Maybe you're single in here and you're like, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, have, I don't really have any desire to get married. Don't worry. You know what? You have, you have a unique opportunity to glorify God in a way married people can and vice versa. You're not, you don't have to be married. In fact, Paul said, he said, it's better not to be married than to force your way into it. But you know what? You're, you're unique. And in your singleness, God still designed you for a relationship. So you can't just say, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to stop. No, let me tell you something. God's got a plan, and he wants to use you. And so whenever she's praying over you, just lift your hand up. If it's speaking to you, nobody's going to be looking. But just receive the ministry of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. No matter where you're at. Some of you may be multiple failed relationships. You are not disqualified, and God's doing a work. He's, I believe that. I believe there's healing in this place today, Caleb. Pray for him. Jesus. Jesus, we just lift up your name above every name. We lift up your name above disappointment. We lift up your name above just disillusionment and just 
disappointment all over the place. But Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you have given us the gift of marriage. Thank you that it is truly a gift that we get to share, a oneness that um, just can't be broken. It's just a depiction of how to live our life through you, Lord, with our oneness with you. You have display that through marriage as a oneness with our spouse. And so, Father, we just thank you for the for the gift of marriage, for the gift of family. Uh, Father, right now, I just pray for every household. I pray that joy. I pray that love. I pray that the husband and wife will just one another, look at one another again like they did when they were in their youth, Father, and that they will be able to see each other for what the, the things that they truly were drawn to each other from the very beginning that you will restore that take them back to that place take them back to that um to the to the very beginning the first love whenever they were um trying to impress one another and the beautiful and the attributes that they had and they were able to see and so father take them back there to those places right now once once again so that they will truly be able to start from ground zero from the very beginning and start over father and so that they can have restoration you restore things and when you restore things you don't just put them back into place you make them better than they ever were to begin with there are marriages that are just in destitution right now that they are just falling apart that they are just helpless and hopeless but father I have seen it a million times where you have taken just the worst of situations and you have turned it around and restored it to better than it ever was and so father I'm speaking to over the marriages right now I just ask for your rest Restoration. I pray for pride to be just bound up right now in the name of Jesus. And that um, mothers and fathers, that they would just make a line in the sand, draw a line in the sand right now and just say, as for this day, no more. We're not going to do this cycle, this vicious cycle anymore. We're going to fix things before they get broken. We're going to see things. We're not going to just be strangers just being roommates anymore, just glorified roommates, Father. But we're going to really see each other. We're going to have heart connections. We're going to have intimacy again. We're going to have long talks. We're going to have pillow talk. We're going to have rivers of living water flowing from our very beings father we're going to have heart relationships and unity we're going to have a oneness like we've never had we're going to have just like a beautiful tapestry just being sewn back together where things have got torn and where holes have just be began to just drill holes into things father into the our marriage into our core father you're just going right now with your mortar and you're just Hatching all of those beautiful things and making them beautiful again. And so, Father, I just pray that um, that the children, that just from the flow of the home will just be joy. And it will be peace. And that love will just flow. And that that the, the things that have been stopping up, that love from flowing, from love being received and love being given, Father, I just pray that you will just reveal those things right now to every person in this room. That you will just begin to reveal the things that have been stopping Stopping up the flow, the rivers of living water, and that you would just right now come with your wrecking ball, come and just just explode all of those things, and just let that water just come, and let that life just come, just come into our homes right now. I pray right now for the people that are going through. Um, that they feel condemnation and guilt that maybe I didn't do enough if I should would have done this different if I and, and Lord I just pray that you will put peace over their hearts right now peace over their minds father that they have the mind of Christ and that they have it that you have not forgotten them you have not forsaken them that they are still here they are still ready to be used they are that they will that you will come to a realization that you can be used by God no matter what you don't have to put yourself out you don't have to reject your even yourself and pull yourself away from the the body of Christ but that you can be used you can be a value I pray father that we will just begin to pull the treasure out of one another in every relationship father that we will find the goodness that we will find the treasure we'll move all the dirt father we'll move mounds and mounds of dirt so that we can find that treasure in every single relationship chip and for with every single person in this room father and I just pray right now that a peace of God and a, just a joy that comes from 
from heaven above will be found in our homes and that we will be healthier than we ever have been at a year from now that we can look back and see how our marriage is not immature anymore but it is so mature in Christ and we realize and we've just been able to own up to the things and that pride has been swallowed that pride's been gone with and that we've been able to see differences in our lives and a year from now our marriages our relationships our lives our community everything is different and it is restored and it is better than it ever was before and we just declare these things by faith we declare these things over these over this congregation of this group of people we declare it in jesus name amen and amen amen stand to your feet amen give god some praise I, I, I want to end with this. Listen to me. You are not cursed. That's a, that's a promise from God. Jesus, you are not cursed because he died your death and rose from the grave. And because of that, you're blessed and not cursed. So watch this. If you're married and your marriage is good, you're not cursed. Don't be worried about it. Don't be going, oh man, it's, I'm waiting for the other shooter to drop. No, let me tell you. You're blessed. You're not cursed. If your marriage is jacked up, it's a mess. You're not cursed. There's hope for you. There's grace. There's mercy for your mess. If you are divorced or widowed, watch this. You're not damaged goods. You're not cursed. You are blessed. If you are single, never have been married, want to be married, but can't seem to get married or never want to be married, you are not cursed cursed you are blessed Lord remind us that we are a blessed people and as we leave this place today we're encouraged equipped and enabled to walk in the fullness of everything you prepared for us to enjoy the benefit and the fruit of good relationship not just so what we can get out of it but what we can put into it not so we can be blessed but so we can be a blessing to those that we're in relationship with I pray over marriages, I pray over relationships, and I declare as we continue to mature in this area that the fruit of it will be the blessing of God's people will be seen from far, far away. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We love you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. Hey, love you. God bless you. Have a great week, y'all. See you at Gospel Circle.